Hello, everyone. Welcome back to CBS News. I'm Elaine Quijano. And I'm Nikki Batiste. Here's a quick look at some of the top stories we're following. Two Americans are back stateside and recovering in the hospital after being kidnapped in Mexico last week. Mexican authorities are now hunting for the people responsible for the attack. Two other U.S. citizens were killed during the incident. Plus, there is growing backlash from both sides of the aisle following Fox News host Tucker Carlson's false claims surrounding the January 6th insurrection. It comes as newly released court documents reveal the company's chairman expressed concern the network was going too far with its 2020 election denial claims. And UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visits Kyiv. He made a trip as part of an effort to extend the grain export deal between Ukraine and Russia. His stop coincides with the chief of NATO saying the city of Bakhmut could fall to Russia in the coming days. The city of Milwaukee has seen a disproportionate number of murders of transgender black women over the past year. Police say three people have been killed since June. Cache Henderson, Brazil Johnson, and Regina Maya Allen were each shot to death between last summer and late last month. The victims range from 28 to 35 years old. Joining us now is Chris Allen. He is the president and CEO of Diverse and Resilient. It's an organization providing services to LGBTQ plus people in Wisconsin. Chris, thanks for joining us on such a, an important topic. How are you and the LGBTQ members of the Milwaukee community reacting to these recent homicides? Yeah, it's it's been difficult to, to to deal with these recent homicides because it's it's affecting our community in ways that um, creates additional fear and um, increases discrimination that LGBTQ plus individuals, specifically trans individuals, are facing. Um, so we're we're really trying to work hard to bring awareness to the challenges that our trans community is facing, so that we can make a difference and stop the violence. Well, the ACLU is tracking a record number of bills. It says our anti-LGBTQ bills that have been proposed in the U.S. Why do you think we're seeing these kinds of policies being pushed now and how are they impacting members of the LGBTQ plus community? Yeah, we're we're seeing it for a number of reasons. One of the most uh, prevalent reasons that we're we're seeing it across the country is that it's it's a, an easy distraction um, for some folks to use LGBTQ people and our lives as. Uh, um, in politics. And so it, it takes the focus away from some of the real problems that we have to address in our country and uh, puts the the blame and attention on uh, a minority group of individuals that um, are, are greatly misunderstood. And there's a lot of stigma and discrimination that already exists. And so it's easy to feed off of that. Chris, what actions do you think need to be taken to ensure the safety of the LGBTQ plus residents of Milwaukee and elsewhere? Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we, we one, increase awareness around the challenges that LGBTQ plus individuals are facing, specifically trans individuals, um, and that we, we put a stop to a lot of these bills and uh, the attention that's being put on um, uh, stuff like don't say gay or the uh, bills that we're seeing in, in Tennessee around drag queens and um, people presenting themselves uh, wearing clothing that doesn't match their perceived gender. Um, a lot of these bills place a, a dis disproportionate amount of impact on trans individuals. Um, we, we see this when there's a lot of focus on pr trying to protect children. Um, children are not being harmed by transgender individuals. It's it's really a, um, a, a a focus that doesn't need to happen. And so we're seeing a lot of increased violence because of the stigma and discrimination that's coming from this. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding around who transgender individuals are, um, what they what they do in their lives, and ways that they can interact within our communities. And we need to place more uh, attention on the positive impacts that our LGBTQ plus community has. Uh, as Nikki said, a critical issue. Chris Allen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. We really appreciate it. Yes.
We're coming up on three years since the pandemic began, and during that time, it's had a huge impact on the workforce and how businesses operate. Yeah, this is really fascinating. A new book by former Wall Street Journal reporter Liz Hoffman dives into how companies stayed afloat and the impact on future generations. It is called Crash Landing, the inside story of how the world's biggest companies survived an economy on the brink. And Liz Hoffman joins us now here in Studio 57 to talk more about her book, Liz, welcome. You know, this is such an interesting topic to me because um, thinking back to three years ago, right, when things were so uncertain, the idea of businesses and big corporations adjusting, it just seemed like where would you even begin to start, right? So you note, though, that in your book, uh, that in this book, that based on past events, we should have been prepared for the pandemic. Can you explain that? I mean, I, I think companies in the economy more broadly learn the same lesson with some regularity. It always comes from a different place. The crisis, the sort of spark always comes from somewhere unexpected. But the tinder is constantly being relayed. Um, the economy is just consistently more fragile than it appears. And if you remember, you know, coming into the pandemic in 2020, unemployment was at a 50-year low. Yes. You know, the stock market was at all-time highs. Things were looking good. Things were looking very good. But, you know, underneath that, sort of veneer of stability and resilience is this incredible, relentless push towards efficiency. You have workers who are no longer part of, you know, very stable union jobs, but are gig workers renting their t their time and their and their houses on Airbnb and Uber and just like a much, much less uh, resilient and strong economy, which is why it all uh, unraveled so quickly. Liz, how do you think this pandemic will affect future generations of CEOs? I think um, setting aside, you know, I, I, I worry actually that a lot of the financial lessons are not learned. You know, you're not seeing companies sock away a ton of money for a rainy day because investors don't want it. The market doesn't, you know, it punishes them for that. Um, I, I think we've been very quick to return to some of the financial bad habits. Um, I think interestingly, actually, sort of the moment that you're starting to see CEOs grapple with kind of what I'll call the culture wars, right, the sort of non-business parts of their job, I think is very squarely comes out of the pandemic. You had this big vacuum of public sector leadership and CEOs really stepped in, I think mostly for admirable reasons, though certainly there's always a little ego involved. <laughs> um, and I, I think they're now finding themselves on a fairly slippery slope when it comes to things like uh, politics and race and social issues where they're sort of expected to have an opinion. And I think a lot of that actually was late in 2020. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I do remember the public surveys at the time showed that Americans did have confidence in the business sector and in business leaders and not so much in the institutions uh, of our democracy. But that has led, as you say, to a bit more expectation, I think, right? When something happens, CEOs and companies are expected to sort of be on the quote unquote right side of things. Absolutely, and the right side, certainly I think there were some things early on that were sort of fairly morally unambiguous. Sure. But the right side of a lot of issues that we're dealing with now is just looks different to different people. And um, I think it's a very, I think most CEOs that I talk to would very much like to go back to doing their day job. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's gonna be something we'll grapple with for the next decade. Liz, what do we learn from the pandemic and how can it be applied to other black swan events, especially climate change becomes more and more prevalent? You know, there's always this tendency, I think, to prepare for the next crisis by preparing for the last one. Um, you know, as a financial reporter for much of the 2010s, it was always like, where's the next 2008? Right. Um, and ultimately, it came from somewhere completely different. Um, you know, I think uh, understanding, I'm not sure that we'll see a lot of changes, but understanding that there are trade-offs to things that um, look like they sort of are, are rising tides. So the, the idea that you can get you know, Amazon sends you something tomorrow, that's great. And, you know, prices have fallen and efficiency, and it's terrific for consumers. But there's a cost to that, which is that there's not a lot of fat baked into the economy right now. Um, certainly you're seeing, you know, the labor market is incredibly tight. Companies can't find enough workers. Prices are still incredibly high. I mean, I think that's all. I think it will all work itself out. But understanding that there is no such thing as a free lunch in, in any economy. And there seems to be an increasing awareness of that fact yes. now, which certainly has changed the landscape as well. Yes. Your book is out now. It Liz is. Hoffman, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having thanks, me. Liz. We're going to take a short break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News, always on. A bird flu outbreak has the White House considering the use of vaccines to help get the situation under control. Earlier on CBS News Mornings, Anne-Marie Green spoke with Richard Webby. Dr. Webby works at the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and specializes in infectious disease research. 
Thanks for joining us this morning. So people would have heard of bird flus before, but what makes this a little bit different, as I understand it, is typically this is a virus that can infect the respiratory systems of birds, but it doesn't, doesn't often hop over to mammals. But it looks like this version of it has been able to do that, and we happen to be mammals. So how concerned should we be over, a, you know, a human adapted version of the bird flu affecting us and maybe setting off another pandemic? Yes, yeah, so good morning, Amarine. And so that's the, the question that we're all asking. Um, this is a virus that is not new to the world. So it's been circulating in parts of Southeast Asia and, and Europe and Africa for 20 years or so. It's only more recently moved into the Americas. But uh, this is where all flu pandemics start off in humans. So all flu pandemics that we've seen over the past century that have made that leap into humans start their life off as a bird virus. So mm. that's why there's this concern. We now have this virus circulating here. It's a bird virus right now, but you know, we know it probably has the capacity to switch over to humans and that's where the concern is. Okay, so we know that, you know, because of this, the price of eggs have kind of gone through the roof. Um, so basic question, if you eat a bird or consume, um, you know, eggs that have had contact with this virus, could we get it? Yeah, so right now the risk from picking up a, a, a chicken leg or an egg from your supermarket is very, very low. Mm. So, you know, this virus is not um, in the food chain right now. So the, the risk from that is, you know, is essentially none. Okay. And what about this option of mass vaccination in order to uh, stem the spread of bird flu? As I understand it, it's a vaccination that has kind of been sidelined, I think, for a while. But now, you know, the administration is considering it. Yeah, so a lot of the reasons vaccination of birds hasn't been used is for trade implications. But mm -hmm. you know, why it makes a little bit of sense here is there's so much of this virus out there now. So if we can reduce the potential contact between an infected bird and a human, that reduces the overall risk to um, human health. So, you know, vaccinating poultry is one way of doing that, reducing the amount of virus that's potentially circulating in those birds, mm -hmm. reduce the contact of infected birds with humans and reduce the overall risk. So again, that's one of the primary, at least from a human health perspective, one of the primary reasons um, the administration is exploring that as an option. And it sounds much better than euthanizing millions of birds, which has basically been the, the option that's been implemented. Dr. Richard Webby, thank you very much. Thank you. CBS is The Talk. We'll kick off a new series of segments next week celebrating groundbreaking women during this Women's History Month. Earlier on the stream, CBS News contributor and host of The Talk, Natalie Morales, previewed the series with Anne-Marie Green and Vlad Dutier and discussed what it means for her becoming the show's first Latina host. Good Welcome. to see you. Oh, thank you, Anne-Marie Vlad. So good <laughs> to be here. Yeah, we're so excited. We're kicking off our uh, groundbreaking series, our groundbreaker series on Monday, starting with some incredible Olympic athletes, some names you just might know, like. Lindsey Vaughn, uh -huh. yes. Chloe Kim, just to drop some names. <laughs> um, and we're, we're out to a couple of others as well, but starting off with female athletes as groundbreakers. And they're gonna be on the show, right? They're gonna be, actually, Lindsey Vaughn is gonna be guest co-hosting with us. And oh, she's so a friend, cool. so I'm really happy to have her there. So it's I'm fantastic. curious, because you guys could have started with anything. Why female yes. athletes? Yes. You know, I mean, athletes, we've seen the power of Title IX. We talk, you were talking yeah. about it on CBS Morning this, this morning. morning. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I just, the, the women who have, you know, risen in sport, yes. it's it's something that so many young girls can see and, and be. If you can see it, you can be it, yeah. as we say here at CBS. And it's that power of representation yeah. that is so important. And I think on the field and on the playing field, that's where that confidence comes from early on for so many kids. I know it did with me as a young girl mm. playing multi-sports growing up. And I feel like we've seen like female athletes speak very openly too over the yes. last couple of years. More than about in the years what, past. Yes, yes. About, you know, what it takes to compete, but yes. also the emotional strain. Like, I don't think we had these oh, conversations yes. and before. And equity you know? in sport. Yes. We've seen that with the U.S. women's national team, which yeah. is so important. Alyssa Thompson, by the way, is also going to be one of our groundbreakers oh, wow. on, on Monday as well. She is the soccer phenom playing for Angel City, but she's also... A graduate pretty soon from high school yeah. and she's already turned pro which yeah. what a story that young woman has and just to see her career and it's she's soaring what's what's fast what's what's troubling sometimes though guys is how 
people perceive women's sports. You even have people in yeah. the news media who yeah. will say things, well, you know, the men's game is more exciting than the women's right. game. Or, you know, you have situations where, sadly, Brittany Griner finds herself having to pay, uh, play abroad, putting herself and her life at risk exactly. because she's not receiving the kind yeah. of pay that the men that is, receive. And yeah. so why, is it, even as we celebrate these women athletes, is there a larger conversation about the system itself? There absolutely is, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because mm -hmm. that was such a great example with Brittany Griner, like having to go to Russia because here she makes, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars playing the WNBA. There she can make over a million dollars, and that's put herself in a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. So, um, so many women were seeing having to do that, mm -hmm. to go abroad to play in a sport that they love because of that. The, the injustice still and the perception that, they're not going to get the crowds and the fan base. Mm -hmm. But we've seen that is not true. It's not true. If you have been to a U.S. women's national team soccer game, and I've been there, I've been there for the World Cups that they've won. I've been there. Like, you know the crowds that they can get. And, and I think that's what's so important is for us to just keep drilling that story home that, you know, it's for young girls, I think their first real confidence maker is being involved in a sport where there are other young women Yes. around them, supporting them, yes. building them up. Yes. The idea of not being fill in the blank enough, I think kind of- We kind know. Of, we've, we've all we, checked we, that we, we, we all, yes. totally table, do. Right? Mm -hmm. And I know I've been yes. told that. You're sort of always in the middle. Right. Um, you know, what? let's talk about what you yes. said, seeing as we couldn't play. We want people to know. Right. You know, what, what, what has that been like? You know, I think early on starting my career in journalism, there were not a lot of Latinas sitting mm -hmm. at an anchor desk. And, you know, being that person who could sit there and again, representation, um, and I remember doing stories and, and, and talking to people and they're like, you're Latina? Like, mm. are you married to a Latino? Like, or who's Morales in mm. your family? I'm like, Morales is my dad. My mom's Brazilian. My dad's Puerto Rican. So I'm, I'm 100%. I lived overseas as an Air Force brat. Panama, Brazil, Spain was, you know, a lot of my formative years. So um, I am so Latina. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Even the way I cook, the way, you know, I teach my kids. And, and I think... Um, that perception was like, because of your skin color or the way, I'm like, there is no such thing. I mean, I have in Puerto Rico cousins with green eyes, blonde hair. Like mm -hmm. there's- yeah. We know that well, we're mixed race children, so all, yeah. Yes, yeah. You yeah. You can no longer say you're not enough of this or that. Just look at America. We are you know, a melting pot of all skin colors, all heights, all types, you name it. Yeah. Mm. And this yeah. is a Latina experience. That's this right. This idea yes. that the, the experience needed to be this sort of rigid yes. box. Exactly. This is a black experience. Th exactly right. right. Even exactly. if it's not exactly the same as other people. And, you, and, and it's something, Natalie, I'm sure you've gone through it your whole life, not even just as a professional woman in news, I mean, as a child growing up, we've talked about yeah. that, you know, white kids would say one thing to us and they right. think that we're this. And then black kids, well, wait, what are you? Where do you come from? And you're not black enough. You're not white enough. And you say to yourself, well, I am all those things, but maybe right. not in the way you see me. Yes, yes, that is so true. And and there is no box for that, right? right. We can't check that box. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you about the talk. I, yeah. you, uh, this is a true story. Yesterday, yes. after you guys left the show, I we were on a text chain with myself, Gail, uh, Tony, Nate and Shauna, and I said, you know, these this chemistry on that show is off the chain. I haven't yes. seen anything like that, that ever. Um, and so what yes. is it like for you guys? You talked about how yeah. you pray before you the cameras start rolling, but we give do. us more insight. And you know, I think that's sort of our grounding. We talked about this uh, yesterday, but like, you know, just starting with that moment in the morning with prayer, but like we are, you know, we're all in this together. I mean, the show has been through a little turbulent times, yeah. we all know. And coming through on the other side of this, I think we are a strong, united front. And what you see is what you get. We are on text chains on the weekends, the same way you guys are. Yeah. Like, you know when you're getting up that early with people that you want to, that you want them to be friends. Yeah. You want them yeah. to be yeah, people yeah, yeah. that you bond with and you you share, you know. Emery sometimes experience. accidentally texts me thinking that she's, I'm her husband. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I My have texts a are good texts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. far, so far. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, nothing, nothing scandalous, no, no, scandalous <laughs> but it'll be like a reply to like pick up the kid or something. Um, but yeah. one last question. I also love the fact that you are retaining your journalism chops. You're doing yes. stories for 48 hours. So You're important. doing other pieces yeah. beyond 48 hours yeah. for CBS News. And I'll be here with you and on CBS Mornings uh, next month. Oh my so God, yeah, I'm wait. coming back to visit. So um, yeah, you know, it's it's so important to me. Again, you know, I, I just want to make sure that 
I can do a little bit of everything everywhere, so that, that right. I can keep having that total experience and continuing to be the journalist that I am because that truly is the passion well, and the calling. Natalie, Natalie Morales, we are very happy to have you. Thank We're so you. happy that you came by to visit. So nice meeting so you. So when you go over there, yes. Yes. you should come over come here. Over again. Here too. Oh, I, I, I absolutely <laughs> will. I'll be bringing you a new 48 Hours next time. Love All it. Right. Yeah, Love good. It. good. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Coming up, it's red and blue. The Senate Intelligence Committee holds a hearing to discuss the growing number of global security threats, what it means for the U.S. and its allies. And Democratic Representative from Minnesota Angie Craig joins us to discuss the Senate vote on a controversial D.C. crime bill. Red and Blue is next. You're streaming CBS News.